In the early hours of June 6, 1944, Allied paratroopers were dropped behind enemy lines close to the beaches in Normandy, France. It would mark the beginning of D-Day and was a major turning point in World War II. Nearly 60 years later, many of the battles and events which took place that day would be digitally recreated to form a historic backdrop for one of the world's biggest video games. Tulsa is a very Midwestern city. Uh, it's about half a million people, very friendly atmosphere. Uh, we were the only game company, you know, in Tulsa. After we had started Infinity War, we had made a Medal of Honor Allied Assault, and we put, you know, over a little over two years into that, and uh, we had to start over from scratch. During my time at Amblin, while the guys were working at Tulsa, I had spent most of my time focused on supporting the future film and animation divisions. The Medal of Honor was one of the flagship titles for Dreamers Interactive, and it was pivotal in getting the whole division up and running. When I heard that 2015 was becoming Infinity Ward, it was really exciting. I, I really loved their work on Medal of Honor. I saw some early screenshots of Call of Duty, and I was, I was a big fan. Uh, I couldn't wait to see what they'd come up with next for Activision. After we had started Infinity War, we knew that our competition was Medal of Honor. In some ways, like, I kind of see Medal of Honor Allied Assault um, as almost like a Call of Duty Zero. And just, we didn't really have any people telling us not to do something. We found a publisher that, for the most part, you know, recognized us as a talented group of people and said, do your thing and make a good game. I got my start in Call of Duty back uh, in 2003. Um, on the very first Call of Duty, I actually, this is back when, like, GameStops weren't around. We had electronics boutiques. So um, I had gone there a couple days early because they had the game early and, and gotten the game. That's how big of a fan I was then. I was following um, the 2015 guys, the Infinity War guys since Medal of Honor. Um, so yeah, Call of Duty was like, was like the best new thing. It was the hot new thing for us. Um, it was amazing. I, I just remember like watching all the trailers and seeing the bullet impact effects coming off the walls and the shell shock effects and the um, like the real-time craters that would form in the ground when something went off and an explosion went off. Those for the time, for 2003, you know, that was like revolutionary stuff. Um, you didn't see that in other games. Before that, we were, we were playing like Return to Castle Wolfenstein or, or, or Allied Assault. So, um, you know, the, just visually, the game seemed so immersive. You, you're aiming down the iron sights, you're bringing up the sights, and that hadn't been done before. Um, those were like just, at, for its time, so revolutionary and, and, made, uh, and made myself and all my friends think that like, this was gonna be the future. All right, down the trench, move out! We had to start over from scratch because we were able to redo everything that we did poorly. You know, if there was any legacy code that, that, that would have I know, that would have created problems in the future, we could redo that and and basically make a much tighter engine. Hold this position, man! Fall back to the bridge on my come on! You know, I started with Call of Duty 2 and really got uh, into that game more so than the first one I had played on the PC. And just being able to use the same weapons and you know see some of the situations, you know, it was really actually very interactive and having the dialogue in the single player campaign and just knowing like certain situations that some of these soldiers had to go through, I think that th that's just, it just blew my mind, you know, and I think that's what draws a lot of people towards video games. There were a bunch of names thrown around. I, I remember one of the names we were likely to pick was actually Tour of Duty. And I think that at some point around the, along the line, I think it might've been Todd Alderman that came up with Call of Duty. And we seem to like that a little bit better, um, and so that's kind of what we stuck with. The building that we were in was, was ridiculous. It looked like a science fiction book or, or movie or something. I, I believe it was like 40 to 50 floors. I'm not sure exactly. It was, it was really tall. It was in the middle of nowhere, just flat land, and then these three giant buildings. We 
we've been making video games for a long time at Gearbox, one of the earliest original things that we created was the series called Brothers in Arms. And at the time, you know, it was really interesting because uh, there was another franchise, when we got started, there was another franchise called Medal of Honor that was also telling stories about soldiers in World War II. And we really wanted to capture the feeling of what it would be like. Medal of Honor was a great game, but it was more action-oriented. Uh, we wanted to deliver an authentic experience. What's interesting is the Medal of Honor game was so successful that while we were building our game, uh, other folks started showing up as well. The Call of Duty franchise got started that same way. While we were working on our game, they started working on theirs, and, and they showed up a little bit before us with the first Call of Duty game, which was a World War II shooter, very much like Medal of Honor. The Brothers in Arms game allowed for tactical gameplay in addition to action skill tests. First Call of Duty game was so great. I mean, I don't know if anybody thought about competition. I mean, we just loved what we were working on. You know, we, we just knew um, what we built there was just special. It's not, it stood out um, against other first person shooter games, even, you know, in older two genres. So um, everybody was just excited about what we're working on and that's what we con concentrated on. Landing the fields and you were going, there was the cattle were there and you were lying behind the cattle and using them as, as, as cover from incoming fire. And it, it was like, they'd been shooters before, but they were very, they hadn't really tried to draw you into that universe. And I think the story element, uh, for Call of Duty at the time, especially World War II, uh, a subject I was very interested in anyways. Um, I hadn't been done before, and I think that's why it, you know, it captured my heart. With the team in place and its first game in development, Infinity Ward decided to pack their bags and head west. At the time, no one really knew about Infinity Word. Um, I, in fact, I didn't know about Infinity Word. Um, I was just doing research, and I found out there there was a game developer not too far from where I live, and they are working on the World War II game, which I'm a huge fan of. So I just went over and, and you know, just wanted to join the team, and, and that's how I got in there. And I had no idea about their history with um, previous titles and stuff like that. Um, but when I joined the team, I remember it was about 20 some people it was fairly small size and and there was the team was very unique i have to say um i don't think you can replicate um that the original team that was there like anywhere else there are a handful of our developers that were a little bit into world war ii history but i think as i saw as time went on more and more guys were reading books and watching all, all the films and 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 the documentary. So even though it was a job, it kind of became a little bit of a hobby for a lot of guys. I'm not a big fan of the weapon at that time. I was just like a general artist. But since then, I have to, I fell in love with uh, weapons and I, I studied what is the World War II weapon, what is the modern weapon, how weapons working functionally. It helps a lot. I learned a lot at that time. As internet bandwidth improved, players began to form their own teams and compete in online gaming leagues. We were playing in, at the time with the competitive scene. Um, so we were competing in ladders and leagues and I started to take an interest in mapping and modding. Um, Call of Duty uh, United Offensive came out, the expansion pack to, to Call of Duty 1, and we were downloading the GTK Radiant. Uh, which was the map editor, and we were going in and just playing around, goofing off and creating maps and having a good time. We were organizing and planning what kind of mod we wanted to make around United Offensive, so that way when COD 2 came out, we can get the, the tools and we could uh, we can go to work. So we made a mod called Unbound Forces. And, uh, and for us, we wanted to bring that into the modern day. So it was set in 2049. Uh, we had the tactical response unit, which was like the protagonist force against mercenaries, against the mercs. It was a really cool mod for its time. It had a lot of innovations that ultimately ended up being in Call of Duty. I'm not saying that there was influence there, but um, we were definitely going in the right direction. When I was uh, younger, uh, I used to compete. I played, I played Doom, uh, and I played it competitively. 
and I, I even played it professionally in a, a few instances where I played in tournaments and won won money. Um, and then uh, when by the time Quake had come out and taken over, I was I was in the industry as a developer. It was just getting online and playing in lobbies. You know, I, I had a really good internet connection. You know, something that a lot of people were kind of lacking back then. I mean, it's still they're still getting better and better, but uh, I think just what kind of happened was that it was competitive. So the multiplayer was there in the game, it's available, and it became something that um, I kind of transitioned from, you know, playing video games just for like the storylines in the games, the single player campaigns, and then all of a sudden, you know, you have this multiplayer aspect. Basically, there wasn't even a term esports back then. Like it started to loosely be thrown around because it was it's essentially was created as a marketing term to be able to sell the concept of what these games were as a package. Esports is one thing to people like sponsors, etc., and outside people who weren't from the tech industry or gaming. So at the time, we never called it that. Actually, we used to just call it whatever the game we were following was. So initially, I followed Quake. So I never thought of it as esports. I just thought this is quite competitions for Quake. And the impulse was just to watch the best players play. Basically, you just want to see the, the best action and see the, the players who are the top players battle each other. I grew up playing, of course, video games, the GoldenEye, 007, of course, the classic. And then I discovered Call of Duty and I was like, this is so much fun. And a lot of my friends played, so we would always go online and just play completely, just nonstop. Infinity Ward had taken the World War II series to its limits. But there was still major ambition to move forward once again. After we finished Call of Duty 2, and it was a good success, but you know, by then we had actually worked on World War II games for longer than America was involved with World War II. So basically we were just really sick of World War II. And so we're like, hey, let's do a modern Call of Duty. And so we, uh, I think Vince and Jason had a meeting uh, with Activision and said, hey, we're really pumped about this idea. We have helicopters, you know. Uh, AT4s, all these cool technology, and we were like, yeah, they're gonna love this. They're like, nope, everyone wants World War II. Look at the charts, you know? <laughs> Everyone's buying it, and, and we hadn't even hit, we haven't really hit the World War II peak yet. So we made a prototype that was modern day without Activision knowing, and showed it to them, they loved it. They're like, all right, well, sold. So uh, that's when we made Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare, you, uh, you play as multiple characters, uh, British SAS and uh, Marine Force Recon are the main characters in the game. So this is actually the prototype that we made for Activision to show how cool Modern Warfare would be. It's the final version that shipped with the game. So in Modern Warfare, you're going to be going to, uh, to the Middle East, you're going to be going to uh, various regions of Russia. There's even a cargo ship on the high seas. It's uh, really a, a huge variety of gameplay, a huge variety of location to, uh, to keep the player enthralled in the game and kind of keep guessing as to what's coming next. Jason West, uh, Vince Zampella, Todd Alderman, those are like the original guys behind Call of Duty. I met them all before um, Call of Duty 4 came out. Um, I'd gone out for that community press event. They had a, an, an agenda. They needed to, to sell in all these new ideas that were coming with Modern Warfare. On my command, you will fire on the target! Target! So we knew early on that transitioning from World War II to modern warfare meant having much closer collaboration with the military. So in that regard, we, we set up a lot of field trips, trying to get in really close with a lot of the guys that are out there doing their job at that moment. We spent uh, a couple days out in 29 Palms where we just did field exercises with the guys out there. Real Marines doing real life flight exercises in a mock-up city in the desert. It was 110 degrees. The guys were completely exhausted. We had to wear the armor, we had to wear the, the helmets. We ran around. It was, it was, um, it was exhilarating and tiring and, and really granted a new outlook towards what those guys did, especially for our developers where we pretty much sit at a desk for the most, you know, for the most part. So going out there and, and being with them, and understanding what they go through, how they think, how they move, how they talk, how Marines are different from Army, how Army's different from SAS, uh, really helped inform our storytelling in the game. Too much radiation, I have to go around. Follow me. 
and keep low. Careful. There's pockets of radiation all over this area. If you absorb too much, you get a dead man. That transition to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare really gave you this re refreshing feeling, you know, as a Call of Duty fan, something that uh, a lot of people were kind of uh, on the fence about, I think, originally when, they, when Infinity Ward announced that they were making a Modern Warfare game, and it's something that was a little bit outside of the box. But, you know, as it kind of came closer to launch date, they released a, a beta of the game, and I think that was really instrumental in when people got to play the multiplayer beta of Call of Duty 4 and talk about it with their friends, you know, I, I couldn't stop playing it. And it was just so refreshing to have guns like the M4, the M16, you know, and you're learning about the guns. You have the 556 five, round that goes into it. So you're literally learning about some of the modern warfare uh, aspects that actually work in the real world. I feel like it was kind of dumb luck by Infinity Ward, but those two guys that were a part of it, they made the game so competitive, and I don't even think they tried to do it. The game was just, it had the basic settings of it, just appealed to every player. Every game that everybody played in Call of Duty 4, everyone just had an amazing time. Like, even if you lost, you had fun, just because the game played so well. It was so smooth, uh, you know, I think that was one of the first games to ever do 60 frames per second. Everything, when you play it, is smooth, and you don't get that with a lot of games on console. That's only something that you feel on PC, and that's why I think it's so successful. I mean, there's always games influencing your own games. Our leveling system was 60 levels, same as World of Warcraft. Um, the pacing, the amount of time you had to play to level up was actually also very similar with WoW. Because I think World of Warcraft kind of touched like a very mainstream base. So we looked at experience bars. We looked at ways of having your character stand out and, and have attributes and characteristics that were very personal to the player. And so all these things kind of just made sense to incorporate into a first person shooter. The perks, the experience bar, ranking up, unlocking weapons. It, it, just, it just took gaming to another level. Map design was just, you know, very, very nice to play from a competitive aspect. and. You just felt like you were in a lot of situations that were fair when you would fight, face off in a 1v1 gunfight. So uh, parts of the map is really important in level design for multiplayer games to make sure that one side of the map isn't more advantageous than the other, right? You always want to make sure there's some kind of level of balance in play, and I felt like that was uh, a level design aspect of Call of Duty 4 that was just done, they did an amazing job with that. Au début, j'ai trouvé ça tellement différent, mais j'ai tellement aimé, donc j'ai commencé sur la bêta en plus. Euh, pour moi, le jeu était futuriste, il était, il était trop bien fait. C'était le jeu parfait, franchement, c'était le jeu parfait. Et euh, bah, je l'ai squatté comme cas du CD. Hein, After success with Modern Warfare, developers Treyarch were assigned to produce a new game, returning to World War II. I don't think anybody was certain that Modern Warfare was going to be as successful as it was, which is why Treyarch was starting on a World War II game a year before Modern Warfare came out. The, the team had actually uh, switched away from the COD 3 engine and, and switched over to what the, the COD 4 engine was. It was also a follow-up to Modern Warfare, which was like, that was when the franchise entered like mega franchise status. It went from maybe 2 million units to 10 million. Find out if another unit came in ahead of us. I felt like it was another refresher, you know, you're bringing that new population that only experienced the modern warfare in Call of Duty games to back to that World War era with those old players and it was just it just made sense. So uh, you had players actually play both games simultaneously. You would take a party into World at War but go back and play some Call of Duty 4. As Infinity Ward prepared to launch their highly anticipated Modern Warfare sequel, not everyone shared the fans and developers' enthusiasm.
Oh, order. Mr Keith Vaz. Are we aware that at midnight tonight a new and violent video game called Call of Duty Modern Warfare is to be released? It contains such scenes of brutality that even the manufacturers have put in warnings within the game telling people how they can skip particular scenes. Given the recommendations of the Byron Review, specifically paragraphs 32 and 33, what steps is the government proposing to take in order to ensure that these violent games do not fall into the hands of children and young people? It's not about censorship, it's about protecting our children. The, uh, the, the clearest recommendation of the Byron Review is that content suitable for adults should be labelled as such and sold as such that it should be an offence to sell such content to children. Uh, that's the case under current law. It's the ca it will be the case uh, under the law when it changes in the Digital Economy Bill. This game, the, the game the Honourable Gentleman refers to, is a Certificate 18 game. It should not be sold to children. Uh, and the, gov the government's job is to make sure that adults clearly labelled can get what adults should be able to and that children do are not an in danger of being subjected to adult content. We really want the player to understand the gravity of the moment and understand how bad the bad guy was and how this was a catalyst to World War III. And in that regard, I think we, we really achieved it. We gave players opportunities to skip that at the beginning of the game, to say opt out of these things if you don't want to see this material. But we felt it really lended itself well and we weren't doing it for shock value. We were doing it to put the player in a position where war is horrible, horrible things happen. And this is a scenario that may not be able to take place in our fiction. A lot of us here have kids. You know, even when we were making Call of Duty, as cool as it was, it wasn't something that we could show our kids. Obviously, for you know, um, uh, um, the violence level that's in the game. So, what do I think about the campaign to ban modern warfare because of the violence in it? It's a, it's a very important question. All I can say is that I think as creators, whether it's for video games, movie, television, we have to have a point, we have to have a message to send, we have to, if we're going to do anything with sex, violence, racism, anything, uh, that are these hot button trigger kind of topics, it can't be done irresponsibly. You have to take responsibility for what you're going to show to your viewers because they're taking it as a story. They're taking it as something that they're participating in. And video games, it's important that our kids who are under a certain age don't get exposed to that. The Modern Warfare series had broken all previous sales records. Its publisher decided the time was right to make a difference outside of the video gaming community and put something back. The Call of Duty Endowment was founded in uh, late 2009 by Bobby Kotick. Uh, Bobby really wanted to find a way to give back to veterans um, you know, as a group that has certainly inspired many of uh, Call of Duty's games and um, as, an org you know, as a, a group of people who uh, he just felt were really in need. So that was the, uh, uh, the genesis of it. And, you know, I think the specific focus on putting vets in jobs was 
also really important because, and this is borne out over time, that we've learned really giving a vet a, a job when they come back, helping them find a job is the best way to help them reintegrate into society. The Call of Duty endowment is such an amazing thing and I'm really glad that Activision had chosen to give back to those who, you know, give us our freedom. So um, we, we get a lot of fans that are in the military and to see them play the game and um, just to be able to give back to them is uh, just a, a blessing. The notion of volunteering, raising your hand and saying, I'll do anything, that's a virtue in the military. In the civilian world, when you are looking for a job and you go to an employer and say, I'll do anything, that's actually a hindrance. That's something that companies don't know how to react to. So there's things veterans have to be taught on their way out, or transitioning service members really, have to be taught so they can be successful in the civilian world um, wh when they get out. They've got all the fundamentals right. They've got hard work, they've got great experience, they have leadership, um, they have discipline, they have creativity, they have adaptability, they have teamwork. Um, they just need to know how to talk about that more effectively to essentially learn how to sell themselves. There's a Marine, a severely wounded Marine, who was speaking um, at a major investment bank in New York one day, and he was talking about the value of hiring veterans. And a banker stood up and said, look, it's great what you're doing, I really applaud that, but I gotta be honest with you, I'm worried if we hire a vet, is this veteran going to go postal on us? And New Yorkers being New Yorkers, they tend to speak their minds, and, but the Marine took it in stride, and he said, okay, fair question, let me ask you this. How many of you here in this New York investment banking office were here on 9-11? About half the room raised their hands and said, yeah, we were here. So he, he, the Marine then asked, did any of you, have any of you since ever maybe had some fear about going up a tall building, maybe lost some sleep, maybe gotten a little distracted at work at times? And a lot of heads were nodding and said, you may have post-traumatic stress, but that doesn't make you a bad banker. That doesn't mean you can't be effective in your job. If you have the right help and counseling, it's just one more issue people have to deal with. Treyarch were given the task to produce something in a dark and more sinister era. A time of covert operations unclassified missions, espionage, and the threat of nuclear war. So being able to make a whole game like Black Ops, the, the gloves were off. We were in the Cold War era. And then because it was Black Ops, because it was Black Operations, these deniable ops, these deniable missions, we didn't also didn't need to um, adhere strictly to historical authenticity. We could take some creative liberties with the stories we were telling, because it's like, well, you know, how do you know this, that this didn't happen during the Cold War? How, how do you know this wasn't one of those classified missions? Hold your fire, work to disguise. Hey, what we're good. There were some other names. Call of Duty Cold War was was an obvious one. Call of Duty Vietnam, back when back when it was much more Vietnam slanted of a game than than bigger Black Ops. And we were able to work with Activision to like focus test all these different names and see what resonated best with people. And um, and, and Black Ops ultimately was like far and away like the right decision. By 2010, the Modern Warfare series had broken new records. Highly acclaimed by critics and fans, Activision had made a blockbuster. And the BAFTA goes to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. goes to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Wow. Uh, well, on behalf of everybody at Infinity Ward back in Los Angeles, California, 
Uh, thank you for this award. It means a lot. Uh, every one of us, we're just a team of just under 100 people, so we consider ourselves very small, and we're all personally invested in this game. So uh, this means a lot, so thank you very much. That steel case is uh, autographed by Gary Oldman. We started getting a lot of more like athletes and, and celebrities that loved Call of Duty and wanted to come um, see our studio. And I got to meet the entire Dodgers lineup and I'm a huge Dodgers fan. Vincent Jason went to the regular Monday meeting over at Activision in Santa Monica. And they didn't come back. I was in London, I was on a press tour, and I just remember getting done with a, a series of interviews and just checking my email and, whoa, like, like, are you kidding me? Is this is actually happening? Where's Vince and Jason? Vince Sampella and Jason West were fired by Activision for insubordination and immediately left Infinity Ward. The next day, we had security people outside of our office, you know, wearing regular civilian clothes with just walkie-talkie. They would just watch us go into our office. As a team, we just stayed really focused, and um, you know, we empathized with a lot of our a lot of our friends and colleagues who were over there who um, were caught up in the middle of it, and, and you know, we wanted to be supportive of that and empathetic of that, and at the same time, like there was just so much like you had to had to tiptoe with with just how how high profile that, that legal thing was, right? All the, um, you know, keep, keeping of records and needing to, needing to send records and go into meetings and, and tell your side of the story. It was, it was a tough time for everybody involved. Pretty much everyone loved Vince and Jason. They're just a huge part of the success of the game. Um, and as soon as they were fired, like, you know, we were kind of freaking out. Multi-billion dollar lawsuits followed, and after two years, the court battles were settled. Vince Peller and Jason West formed a new studio, Respawn Entertainment. Activision brought in new developers, Sledgehammer Games, to continue work alongside Treyarch and Infinity Ward on the Call of Duty series. The business and machinery side of our industry often would wish us to do what is reliable and what we've done before and just do it again and do it a little bit better next time. Uh, but a creative wants to, to take risks and try new things. And so we see it all over our industry where sometimes creative talent doesn't want to just keep making the same game that the business machine wants them to make. And sometimes there's a split. We saw with with the, the creative people that created Infinity Ward at Activision um, left and started a new studio that made Titanfall. What a brilliant, creative new angle. We saw that the folks that created Halo with Microsoft uh, regained their independence and offered us destiny. Well, Call of Duty is such a big game. You have to consider the multiplayer side, the uh, single player side, the um, uh, at the time, the spec ops side, and, and how the features that you're creating really integrates with all those. 
specifically with the Call of Duty formula, you got people like Vonderhaar who have to, they have to craft these incredibly complex, uh, uh, basically living organisms at the end of the day, um, when, you, when you look at what a multiplayer game is. The goal of the game always in multiplayer was to keep the speed up so there's always a, a intense action and something new happening. Killstreaks uh, function as a reward to the player. So as the player is doing well, they're rewarded with uh, extra points. As they build up these points, then they get to unleash a killstreak. Uh, what a killstreak is, is a special ability. So it could be a unique weapon. It could be a defensive ability that uh, enhances the entire team. It could be an offensive action that takes out a whole bunch of enemies. So these, in, in this uh, UI from, whoops, from this game, the killstreaks are on the left here and it's a, uh, I'll show you right here. It's a simple little system that tells you how many kills you need to get to get the next kill streak. Each of those icons would light up. It's essentially like it keeps you on the edge of your toes while you're playing the game because you want to do really well. It makes you try hard. You don't want to die. Um, you have to get a certain number of kills in a row without dying to be able to get a kill streak. And then the more and more kills that you get without dying, the higher level kill streak you're awarded. Good players tend to memorize which kill streaks they have and how many kills they've made, so that as they're playing in their mind, they have a count going of one, two, three, I've got my UAV, four, five, I can put out my next one, things like that. So it really gets you, um, it puts the pressure on to not die. The mappers had a really hard time. I think they have some of the, they're the unsung heroes because you take it for granted. You run around a level, you think about the weapons, you think about the kill streaks, you think about the game mode, and people take the map for granted. Um, and it really takes someone with a really innate knowledge of flow to be able to design a space that'll work so that everybody can in there, be in there running around together, have places to hide, have lots of places to shoot other people. And so these are completely different things. And so when they're always looking for successful ways to accomplish those, a lot of times they'll go back to the favorite maps, the classics, Crossfire, things like that that all the fans love and, and try to look at what are the key points of this map that create this fun. Every little detail, every little, every little facet of when you walk through a multiplayer map is scrutinized to the umpteenth degree. Like you can't imagine uh, how many hours are spent just, just, just pining over every little detail. Um, whether whether a, a, a window should be a, a, an inch higher, an inch lower, whether a waterfall should be to the left or to the right, what that does to the view distances, what that does to the sight lines of the map. Um, you know. It's all part of it. All of that adds up to what is the magical Call of Duty formula. The esports players would sit in with our play test. We would play test all the time, every day, more than once a day often, especially when we were getting towards the end, and be able to get immediate visceral feedback. So you can give someone a game and tell them to write a questionnaire, but if you're watching them play, the body language, everything they say while they're playing, things like that, their, their enthusiasm or lack of enthusiasm after they play, all these things you, you give you amazing amounts of feedback. Fast action multiplayer mode requires full hand-to-eye physical ability. But not everybody has these gifts. Crouch. Jump. Hey. Stop. Oh, yeah.
Stop. If I wasn't disabled, I probably would have been a soldier. A lot of people nowadays play multiplayer games, they like to play online, they like to play with their friends, etc. But for me, campaign mode is really important. You know, as a disabled person, I can play with the games, but I'm never going to be as good as able-bodied people. For me, I love story. Uh, the single player campaign for a Call of Duty title was always an exciting thing to work on. We had really big budgets to get the best writers, the best actors, great motion capture people, everything we needed to do a huge film-like summer blockbuster production. The campaign mode is something special because it has a, a great storyline to it. And when, and when you're playing in campaign mode, you're not just playing a game, but it feels like you're completely immersed into it and you're, you know, and you're following the story and, and it feels like you're completely locked into that game. And for me as a disabled person, you know, to be in, playing a game which you're totally immersed in feels like I'm out of my body and into someone else's body and playing a completely, you know, a game which is, it, it's a kind of out of body experience in a way. Okay, so to play Call of Duty I use a chin joystick, which basically acts like a mouse. It lets me move the cursor around on the, on the computer. But when I'm playing Call of Duty, it actually lets me control the camera. So I can rotate to different angles and, and aim when I want to shoot, etc. And to fire, I use my button, which is next to my hand. Um, it's just a soft switch. And to actually move forward, backwards and change weapons, I use a program called Glovepy, which is a voice recognition application. And the way it works is that you can actually map keyboard keys to voice commands. So I can say the word forward and the character would move forward. I can say left or right and the character would move left and right. But more importantly, it also lets me do things like change weapons so I can say change and it would switch from a rifle to a handgun or if I say the word grenade it would then throw a grenade if I wanted to. I worked in 9 to 5 every day supporting many users around the UK with IT problems so um, I, I do that full time. Call of Duty ranks number one because I know what to expect when I buy a Call of Duty game. I, I know I'm not going to be disappointed. It's, it's going to have good animation, good effects. It's going to have a realism to it. And the storyline is always going to be quite immersive. It's going to make you, you know, follow the characters. And, and, it's, and it's not going to disappoint. General, you're online with the President of National Security Council. Mr. President. General, have you found Makarov yet? No, but we received actionable intelligence on his bomb maker. The situation is developing. Developing? Do you have him or not? Getting into the story, getting into the characters, uh, creating the settings of what really is going to be happening in this world and the story we're creating is always something that's always been really fun for me. Actors, interesting enough, uh, most of them are really big fans of Call of Duty, so very little convincing about coming on board. It's pretty funny, actually, what they do when they're... Um casting for video games. Video games, it's top secret. Everything's top secret. You, for instance, when I did Assassin's Creed or Call of Duty, uh, I didn't know what game I was going in for. Call of Duty was called Eclipse. It wasn't called Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And the character I was going in for was not even uh, called uh, Rahman. It was um, like Hassan or something like that. And <clears throat> I got an, an audition piece. It was like two pages of sides of, of script. And I must have had maybe four lines and no clue what the scene was about other than my character interacting with this other character and being a little bit of a badass, uh, completely out of context of the story. So I did that. She gave me a little direction, the casting director. Uh, I think it was Ivy Eisenberg who did that. And uh, I did it again. She did great. <clears throat> Next thing you know, you get called up. Hey, you got the job on Eclipse. And just so you know, it's... It's actually Call of Duty, Black Ops 2, but don't tell anybody. Every major movie star, all the big A-list stars, are telling their production companies, telling their managers, look for my video game. I want to find my video game. Um, 
either you create one for me if you're a big enough A-list star or wait for the right game to come along and request that I be in it because that's going to put me in a completely different world to a whole bunch of new people and it's going to build my fan base and consequently uh, augment my success and my reach and my marketability and just give me more of what it is that makes a successful actor successful, which is clout, power. There are these different certification milestones that you go through with Microsoft and Sony and you have to make sure that the game is all ready uh, to be created on disc, but there's the actual physical part, sending it out to a factory so that that factory can make the millions of discs that <laughs> are needed, which is, uh, you know, a little bit different for a Call of Duty franchise than some other franchises. Once we hit the gold version, that means it's, it's, it's like a ready-to-ship version. We celebrate in-house. So I remember that we, uh, we had a champagne party, and then we, have a, we bring us some guests and the music. It was fun for the gold version. Then. And then when you're launching, we celebrate uh, at store in the local. So we went there at night when the release day, so many people are in the lining up. We went there together, we, we have uh, some uh, event, we sign up the poster, give them the fan and stuff, we celebrate that way. So Call of Duty always brings a lot of audiences out of the woodwork and into these launches that we have at midnight and we never really anticipate how, how much people are looking forward to our games. We're just making a game. We all work at a desk, just doing our thing. So it's really kind of exciting and crazy to finally leave that bubble and see the real world and everything going on. For a lot of us, uh, that week leading up to a launch meant going out on press junkets, talking to the press, going to different parts of the world and having launch parties there and just getting everyone to understand uh, the developers and meet the developers. For some guys, the coders, the designers and the unsung heroes that had to stay and burn the midnight oil, they were making last minute fixes so that when the game launched, it was stable, it was solid and it was fun. The reason why I queued up for six days and five nights uh, in outside Oxford Street is to be first to get Black Ops 2. Um, I've been to previous midnight launches and I decided that I wanted to be first. I was currently at university. I kind of didn't tell my lecturer, but I kind of took a few days off. I bought a, roughly about three gallons of water with me. I had a really big uh, red rucksack and I carried a, one of those pop-up tents, which unfortunately wasn't waterproof. I found out one night the hard way. Um, I had a sleeping bag, my sister's military sleeping bag, um, which should have kept me quite warm, uh, which it did until it rained. The evenings, I must admit, were very cold and most evenings I kind of drifted in and out of sleep. So I'd be awake for sort of two hours and I'd fall asleep again for another hour and a half and then I'd watch a film in the middle of the night. And it was mostly just, I, saw, I think sort of periods of awake time and sleep just kind of melded into each other because I'd start sleeping during the day. You know, I'd, I'd be awake at night and it was just kind of all patchy really. There was a lot of mixed reactions um, for when I was camping on the street. Like, I'd say half of the people were almost thinking to me like, oh, that's absolutely crazy. I don't know why you'd want to do that. You're taking time out of your own free thing to just sit here on the street. And I'd say the other half of people, they were thinking exactly the same thing, but they were saying, well done. Because I was so cold a lot of the time, it actually took uh, a lot of energy to keep my body warm. So I was eating junk food, but I ended up losing weight at the end of the week, which was crazy. So on the evening of the launch, the atmosphere was really exciting. I was letting the store first, and they had all these people come in, like taking pictures of me and doing videos and stuff. And I got to stand right at the front of the crowd when we watched the show with uh, Mr. Pointy Head. It was really good. But they didn't tell us about what was actually going to happen in the store at the point of the midnight release. So all the lights went out in the store and they played zombie music from Black Ops and it was really awesome. Like they were really scary. They had actual blood dangling from their face and they had contact lenses in. They, you completely mistaken them for real zombies.
They were signing game copies, and I gave him my game copy of the hardened edition Black Ops 2, and he was going to sign it for me. And he kind of looked me up and down and just went, You're crazy, you know that. And then he actually signed the game box and he wrote, You are mental and his signature and then just gave it back to me and he's like thank you so much for queuing up for this game it really means a lot to us i wouldn't take the week back because you know after it's all over i got quite a little bit sad that i'm not going to be waiting in the queue anymore for the game and once you've got it it's a little bit kind of like oh that, the midnight launcher is all over but then you got to play this awesome game so it, it kind of works out Call of Duty really started mostly online with uh, Modern Warfare 1. Still probably the most popular game amongst the pro players. This was where Call of Duty Esports really began. The way I got into it was just by playing a lot and getting better and just meeting the right people. If you want to be a recognized pro player and you want to, you want to be that, that guy that does it, you need to have three people on your team that you enjoy playing with. How these teams normally form is Everyone thinks they're the best. When you get in the lobby and you finish in first place and you're beating up on some other guys who are a little bit less skilled, you get really confident. You start by just playing the game, having fun. And if you enjoy it, you play it more. And if you enjoy it even more, you play some more. And all of a sudden, you're playing with people who are also good. And then all of a sudden, you're in a better team. And you're in a better team. And you're a better team. It's no different from sport. We're not reinventing the wheel here. Simply, it's a case of where you stick put in a pair of football boots and go and kick a ball about, now you'd pick up a gaming pad or a mouse or a keyboard and just play. You want to find that one partner that you want to work with. After that, you'll see a lot of two pairs join up to create a four-man team. Or after just playing other opponents, you'll recognize the best player from an opposing team and try and bring them onto yours. Bon, au début, je le pensais pas du tout, mais vraiment pas du tout. Je jouais vraiment pour le fun. Au fur et à mesure, c'est devenu plus sérieux. Mais, euh, mais au début, non, je le pensais pas. Et puis tout s'est enchaîné. Il y a eu aussi YouTube qui a pris une grosse ampleur, donc des sponsors qui sont arrivés, euh, des teams qui après donnaient des salaires, etc., etc. Et puis là, je me suis dit bon, allez, j'arrête tout. Je me lance essentiellement dans, dans ça. Et vu que c'est ma passion, ben maintenant, je suis pas content d'en être où j'en suis. When you get into a match, when you're playing for a lot of money and you know there's a lot on the line, you can lose at any time. And, and that's the issue with Call of Duty. It's a day-to-day -day game. No matter how good of a team you are, uh, you, there's always a possibility of losing because every team has a possibility of coming out and just shocking, shocking the world. No matter how uh, heavily favored one team could be, another team could win. That's just how Call of Duty is, just because there's such low health and kills are so easy to get. You'll see a lot of team changes amongst the top. There's probably about 64 guys that could win a tournament at any point in time. Even a lot of these players in their own right, they are celebrities themselves. I mean, they have hundreds and thousands of followers on Twitter. They go out and people recognize them in the airport. So it's, it's really cool to see everything that they're doing. Ouais, je fais souvent des rencontres abonnés où je peux rencontrer mes fans. Euh, ils sont vraiment énormes, ils sont toujours là à nous pousser. Même dans la compétition, ils sont toujours derrière nous. Même là, sur Twitter, ils étaient tous « Allez les gars, allez les gars euh, !» Il y a des rencontres abonnés où ils arrivent à 200, 300 personnes. C'est magnifique, hein. il n'y a rien d'autre à dire. Hein. A lot of players will be amazing online, but when they come to a LAN 
and you know the atmosphere is here. They they know they got to perform. There's thousands of people watching them. They kind of crumble. The coaches now are, we're seeing more as motivational tools. So if a team loses, you know if they go two 0 down in a best of five series, and you know the, the heads go down and they start getting demotivated. The coaches are there to say, guys. What are you doing? Pick this up. This is our chance. We're going to win this. Try and rally the troops, if you will, and get them motivated for the rest of the game and see if they can mount a comeback. Very rare you'll see coaches actually, you know, give statistical data, you know, of different things in the game where people are respawning, etc. The coach is really important part of any team. If he sees a player that normally is going to be the lead slayer struggling. Before the player even gets some doubt in his mind, the coach should be there and tell him, don't worry, you're going to get the next kill. Keep focused. He is the one that keeps everyone on the same page, keeps everyone on track. And uh, really, if he's doing his job right, the team is going to stay pumped up. They're going to stay happy. They're going to keep communicating, regardless if they're winning or losing in every single game. When they do have a coach, there's somebody who has this outside perspective that's able to see things that's a little bit different and they're able to hype up their teams and really kind of give them advice on, on where to go. Oliver Sellers is a Call of Duty team coach with mainstream sporting family connections. In the 1980s, his grandfather Ron Atkinson was first team manager of English soccer giants Manchester United. As a team manager, like I said, I like to be very involved. I like to like, know my players from day to day, uh, getting what they need, whether it be a simple thing as whether they've got the right stuff to be able to practice at the highest level, whether that means we get them new, like anything from new game. If they need new gaming monitors, they're a big thing now. People didn't realize three, four years ago how important having like a top brand gaming monitor is. It's like, like any sports, having the best pair of football boots, having the best cricket bat, anything. It's, you get your players the best, allow them to literally perform to their max. There's no saying what they can do. My granddad, he is a big, big part of my life. I would love to get him to an event one day. I think he'd really be able to see the comparisons between a major sport and esports. As much as they're physically playing on a field, we're playing on a computer screen. Like some of the, from having commentators, he's been a commentator, he'd be able to understand like what they do for a game, what a manager's doing for a game between games, talking to his team, like at half time, he gets them in the dressing room, you can turn the team around. Um, it would just be great to see him getting in the environment, see what it is. Counter-Strike looks similar to Call of Duty. It remains one of the biggest titles in professional esports. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest stop on the DreamHack Tour. We are here in London, England. No applause. Disappointed. I thought it was going to get a much bigger pop for that. There we are. I think the people who put in place the mechanisms that have made it big now couldn't have had a clue how successful they would be. What basically happened was, for the first sort of year, maybe just over maybe a year and two months or something, Counter-Strike Global Offensive was not a big game. It wouldn't even have been in most people's top three in terms of the biggest esports games, the most important ones with good prize money, a big circuit, and so player salaries were very low. And actually, with the usual lifespan of games, if you don't make it in the first year, you're basically dead in the war. It's over at that point. So it should have been over. And what actually happened was, Valve had this weird idea, which I still don't understand how it worked, which was to add in the skin economy to the game and create skins. The skin is just what the gun looks like. But having a better skin doesn't make the gun perform better, doesn't make you perform better. It's just something that looks cool, okay? But then someone had the genius idea that you could actually gamble your skins. The thing you gamble the skins on is the pro matches. And then, say they lose, they'll think, right, well, if I'm going to gamble on a pro match again, I better know who this team is. Like, is this team a favorite in this one or not? So you're naturally finding a way for people who otherwise wouldn't normally be inclined to get really into the esports side to sort of, it's almost like a little cookie trail, like, oh, keep following it through. And then eventually they're in esports suddenly. They were just a casual gamer before, but they followed this natural route of like, okay, I'm getting skins. I've got a good skin collection. I want better ones. I'm gambling them. I'm, but and suddenly they're an esports fun. I think what Call of Duty brought was a more of an arcadey feel in terms of just regular matches and gameplay. You know, you had hardcore modes that were more akin to Counter Strike, but trying to make it more palatable for the everyday person who is still interested in 
World War II shooters and modern day shooters so that they can respawn and get back into the action. And in terms of gunplay in field, there was a lot of innovation that was done, even though Counter-Strike did have kick and variants would spread, but I think Call of Duty was, took that to another level in terms of adding more feel to the weapons. In Call of Duty, you find how you move in the world feels a lot more smoother and just a, definitely a marked difference that made it a lot easier for people to jump in. Who's going to win Call of Duty, guys? I'll take It's going to be him. I reckon I'll take I reckon I'll take Yeah. Who's going to win? I'll take how can you boil down the essence of why people want to watch an esports game? And I actually think what it comes down to is, most of the time, it's just like watching any sport. You know, it's just a normal thing, and you have a little bit of vested interest, and you're like, okay, I'll help that player play as well. But because they're the best players, every now and then, they will pull off a move that's so perfect and so superlative in its quality that you almost couldn't even visualize it was possible. But when it's happening, you, can, you just know it's brilliant. Playing in a tournament and making a play and just hearing a crowd roar, you know, hearing people cheer for you. I mean, that, that's a feeling that you just can't beat, you know, and, and it really gives you the sense of, of worth. When the big plays happen, when a player goes off and does something crazy, you then have, you can then look down at the booths and see that player's reaction live as it happens. You can see how intense they all are. Um, but most of the focus is going to be around sort of just listening to the commentators, uh, sort of hearing what's going to be going on and really getting involved in the experience. And you've got massive speakers, so you feel like you're in the game yourself and it's just a really awesome experience. For me, it's, it's all about telling a narrative and I can go from blistering play by play and, and just going for it and explaining the hype in a moment to I'm checking the engagements, I'm talking about a narrative. If it's slowed down or there's nothing going on, I need to explain, well, this is a very good spawn rotation or you did really well staying alive here. Um, this is what they're looking at, this is where they're going. It's, it's difficult sometimes to, to concentrate on everything. And I said, no, no caster is perfect, no driver is perfect. You're never gonna get everything at one point. I said, but you try to keep up as much as possible. So I'm basically looking everywhere. I'm looking at the minimap for engagement, so I'm looking at the strategy, the timer for what, you know, how long's left, what strategies they can put in, um, you know, what spawns they have. All, all this goes into where I'm directing and, and going for it. And it may be I'm hitting on a very thread of a player doing well, or it may be I'm talking about an upcoming rotation or, or a cut that they've got in the map. Any number of things is something I could be focusing on. You have to support this with everything else that any other traditional mainstream sport has. You know, there, there has to be advertising dollars, there has to be structure to the leagues and the tournaments. I'd say the average salary for even a top pro is probably like 100,000. And that's probably like a good one. So there's probably someone like 50,000. So I'd say the people who make the most money in general, because it, it's coming top down from investment, it's like the person who's at the top level of the tournament organizer, and then the person who owns a team, and then the person who yeah, what else would it be, like an agent or something? And much like most sports, it's only at the end that it tends to be the player who becomes the guy who makes the most. In 2013, as esports continued to grow, Activision confirmed its own global tournament, the COD Championships. Call of Duty Esports had now officially begun. There was the Call of Duty Championships, the million dollar tournament put on by Activision and Treyarch out in Hollywood. Impact were able to take the tournament and bank $400,000. So they won three out of their first three major tournaments as a squad together. $550,000 in the space of, it was a month and a half. That's just, that's just crazy. And the only reason they did that was because they put so much time into the game. Team Impact were crowned kings of the world and looked unstoppable. But soon after their winning streak, the global COD champions were defeated at a major event in California by an ambitious new outfit, Team Complexity. Two weeks later, on a hot summer's day in London, Impact would go head to head with Complexity once again. Come on, let's go, play! 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 Come on, let's go, play!
Impacts were beaten. They were so devastated, the team broke up after this event. The professional COD scene was now set for a new dynasty. Complexity were about to achieve a winning streak so great they would write themselves into esports history. Complexity! When it comes to a team, well-rounded, well-prepped, having a strength in every area, I don't think there was much that could contest it. They had everything from an in-game leader, even two in-game leaders really, to some of the best players in the game individually. It was just, they were, they were frightening how good they were. They were great in every regard. They were very, very skilled. They were highly motivated. They had the mental game better than almost anybody. It doesn't matter how many you know, maps you took off them. Always predicted them to come back. And they just outsmarted everybody. It was the perfect storm. We played against them probably about four or five times. Every time we lost, they always won. Regardless if it was close, they'd still end up winning then. They'd pull through somehow. It was very difficult playing against them. Probably the hardest team I've ever had to play against. Matt Morello, in game, he was the hype man. He would build them up, he would give their confidence so high. I said the mental game was just phenomenal. And playing against that and having Matt standing over them, if you were, you know, face to face, it's something that you, as a player, it was difficult because you've got this guy who's not even playing, who's just telling you you're awful, and this guy is amazing. He was the one that, if something went wrong, and you could tell if it was that odd shade of time where the team had maybe lost their composure a little bit in the heads in a big, one thing might have gone against them, he was there to put that back in place. Uh, they were always one step ahead. I remember them being at ESWC, and they were unsure about some of the tactics they were using. So they were deep about changing up the way they were playing. And for me, that was unbelievable. I'm sitting there going, guys, you've maybe got two hours left of playing this ever. And you're sitting there changing up the tactics you're using going into your next game, and changing a player's position and a player's role, because you didn't think it was clicking as well. Professional esports performed at the very highest level is monopolized by male players and teams. For women, the scene is very different. Most of the guys are afraid to be beaten by a girl because it seems like it's like an unwritten rule that guys should be good at gaming or Counter-Strike or anything. But when a girl comes and do it better than you, it's hard to make a living out of it for the girls because there's not enough support. So we can't spend as much time on gaming as the guys in competitive terms anyway. Riot Gaming are an all-female Call of Duty team from the UK who've had to face a series of commercial and gender issues. We don't not want a team with boys. It's more of boys don't really want a team with girls. It is a male-dominated game. 
and I've noticed that through the years it started to show and be brought into like companies not wanting to sponsor certain female teams. We had a, a big named sponsor not wanting to sponsor us just because of the whole girl thing and how it's now portrayed online. But our stats and our marketing was far better than some of the other teams that they sponsored. So that was kind of a bit of a, a blowback. If you're getting abuse from a male as a female, it's normally get back in the kitchen type sort of stuff, you know. And yeah, it can get bad. It escalates, but you just ignore it. It just sort of gets to a point where you want to just prove them all wrong, just to show them that we can, we can exceed the expectations and rise above everything that they're saying. After hearing it a few times, you learn to move past it and to just get, carry on with life, pretty much. Just let them do what they want because it's not really doing anything to you. For women um, entering a, a male-dominated sort of area, people are very judgmental. Other females, maybe their peers that don't play games might judge them on that way sort of lend to them for that and, and also you've got the, the you don't, it doesn't help that the males are also giving them a lot of flack. More girls are coming out to play and there are actually decent females out there that are playing this game too so it's not as bad as it once was but it's it's still there and it still needs to be addressed I guess. The console generation is always going to be a young generation, a bit more immature, and you do see it rub off on social media. There's no reason they can't play in these tournaments with men. There's no reason we can't have mixed teams of men and like, girls. I've seen it happen in Counter-Strike before, another COD 4 PC. There's, there's no reason they can't be in this industry. In 2013, for the first time in video gaming history, the world's two major console brands would launch their next generation machines in the same month of the same year. After Modern Warfare 3, you know, we were looking for what, where did we want to take the Call of Duty franchise. And there were a lot of different ideas, you know, all over the place, like any game company. People also started to look at, you know, what did Modern Warfare bring to the franchise and who were the iconic characters and who were characters that weren't explored and what does that mean? And, that inevitably, I think, led the people who are core to coming up with the story to look at, hey, Ghost is a very iconic and interesting character. What is the story of this character? What could be the story of characters who had this kind of iconic imagery? And let's build something out of that. So that's kind of the roots and seeds of Ghost came from. We were always a very efficient team. You know, uh, I think COD 4 was made with like 60 something people. And uh, when I left, Right at the end of Ghosts, we had 300 people. Of course, we had good relationships with both Sony and Microsoft. With any next generation, it's always about, hey, you know, we have bigger budgets for memory, bigger budgets for effects, bigger budgets for poly counts. There was a lot of extra work, you know, with the next gen consoles, just uh, high, more high resolution models, textures. Uh, so the end effect is you have to hire more artists. The biggest challenge actually was not so much the next gen, it was being able to support next gen and current gen at the exact same time. So that's where you know the challenge is because you want to develop a game that looks amazing on the next gen platform, but then also runs on the current gen. Can we construct this in such a way that it works for both? Or do we just have two sets of models, right? One for current gen, one for next gen. So that's kind of where a lot of the wrangling came into and in trying to make, hey, we made this one game, it looks amazing on you know, next gen, now let's make sure that everything works on previous gen. In Los Angeles, four years after departing Infinity Ward, Vince Sampella and his respawn team made their comeback. When Respawn broke off from Infinity Ward and started working on Titanfall, it's pretty clear that that was the game they wanted to make Call of Duty into. And that was the game that ultimately Call of Duty kind of started to go in that direction, right? That's not a mistake. Those guys are smart. Those guys are, are, are creative geniuses. And I wouldn't say that Titanfall didn't do well. I think Titanfall did better than anybody had expected. For a new IP, for a new franchise, to be able to sell four, five, six million units or more, I'm sure, by, by now, that's incredible for a new IP. That's, a, that's an overwhelming success. Anytime you start a new IP, you know, just like Call of Duty 1, Call of Duty 1 was not a huge game. It was big, but not really that big. And I think you're going to see the same thing with Titanfall. You know, Titanfall is a really extremely polished game, um, really tight gameplay. 
Um, and it's just fun to play over and over and over. Titanfall is a great game. It's, its sales don't represent how good of a game it is. You need a, a brand, and Call of Duty is a huge brand now. You know, it took many years to get that brand recognition, and Titanfall hasn't had the time to get the brand recognition yet. Mechanically, it is fantastic. It really is. The gameplay is superb. The issue being is that it was massively hard. It was massively hard to be this great game, and I played it, you know, early, and I played the demo, I played the beta. And the problem being is the beta was basically the full game. I'm wondering whether or not it was rushed out at the end. It did feel like it at points, there didn't seem to be enough kind of diversity to, to really keep the player going. And it kind of lacked that moment that Call of Duty actually has where you feel like, oh, this is a great experience, let me tell you about this. There were not enough of those moments in Titanfall. You can objectively look at that game as a developer and you can pick out some stuff that just, you know, wasn't quite right, it, was, it wasn't quite magical, but they were doing something really revolutionary and really new. Okay, For that, it was more working. than what it needed to be. Hollywood screenwriter William Goldman once described the non-existent formula in making a successful movie as nobody knows nothing. As technology continues to evolve, the same words can be applied to the future of video gaming. Throughout the entire human history, the form of entertainment always has been something where the audience is sitting on a table or, or sitting on a chair, you know, removed from the stage, and all the show just happens on the stage. And that's been the case for thousands of years. Um, even think about TV, movies, like you're still sitting on your chair and uh, things are happening away from you, apart from you. Virtual reality, what makes it special is that for the first time, for the very first time, as an, you're no longer an audience. You know, you are right in the middle of the action. You can look around if there's an enemy coming behind you, like you can totally look back and then see it coming, you know, from behind you, you know, all these all these things are happening around you. It's not happening within the confined space of this box in front of your eyes. So that makes the experience very different. I think it's going to go back to World War II eventually. I think, you know, as a publisher, there's only so far you can go uh, pushing stuff, and they've done a lot of current, and then they're pushing into sort of near future weaponry, so I think it'll go back. Um, how many more maps they can make? I don't know. There's a lot of, every, every time I see a DLC pack, there's always like a, an old fan favorite that's thrown in. So like we had Sky Rise, which is a remake of High Rise for um, Advanced Warfare. So I think they'll do a bit of that. There's some great COD maps that, are, that have been released in the past. So I think as long as they've got a good team, yeah, they can make as many maps as they want. We are always thinking about virtual reality and how we can make a game in virtual reality. There's uh, a lot of limitations on the performance side. Because of the way VR works and how much you have to render for, for each eye and, and the effect for that, we have to tone it down a little. And, and the tune will fit perfectly with all the things we we're thinking about. Performance, um, fun factor, style, doing things in VR that may not seem so grounded but are just so fun because it's VR. I wish I could tell you what they're going to do. Um, I mean, the developers are really, really um, smart. They've, they've now got a three-year development cycle rather than two years. They've got longer to develop their games, so they've got more time to be creative and do new things. Um, so. I don't know, maybe they will move towards a VR experience where you're literally playing Call of Duty and it's as if you're in the battlefield. For me, it would be much better if, if video game developers would be more aware about the needs of disabled people. And rather than making games where they have disabled people in them, I would prefer it, and many disabled people would prefer it, that they would make games that disabled people could play. Disabled people want to be able to play games. They don't want to be in the games, you know, so that would make a huge difference if programmers and developers would take that into consideration when developing games for, for everyone.
Since 2009, Dan Goldenberg and his team have helped over 22,000 ex-service military veterans get themselves into high-quality jobs. The work is ongoing. Call of Duty's future prospects remain infinite, and the official World League has created a permanent home for its elite esports teams. But the game's developers will know that to remain at the top, innovation and creativity must always come first. So too must reaching out to a highly loyal and passionate community of fans. But as time marches on, the world must never forget Call of Duty's origin and meanings, where it all began, and what happened on these beaches in 1944. The men and women who sacrificed, served and gave their lives in World War II, went above and beyond the Call of Duty. They are, and will always be remembered as the greatest generation. <laughs>